Okay. I think this is working. It seems to be working. Okay, so. Uh, what else is new? I'm late. Not as late as before. And once again, it's because I should have set this up beforehand. So hey guys, what's up? Here is another kind of short notice live stream QA. But I had promised that I was going to be doing these every month, and I didn't do it last month. And I don't think I did it month before, so... No, I didn't do it the month before, but I didn't do it last month. So I'm making up for it. I'm doing it this month. Um, this one's going to be a little bit more freeform. Um, I don't have a preset topic. I wanted to do that. Uh, hopefully we'll have something for next month, like a preset one, before we just go into general questions. But I wanted to at least have one for this month so that people can jump in. Hopefully you guys... Um, We'll be able to find this entertaining. I'm not going to make this one as long as the last one. I think the last one was like, what, two hours? Um, unfortunately, I am a little pressed for time, so I'm not going to be able to make it that long. But I will still at least try to make it long enough for you guys. So before we get into the general questions, um, for you guys to like hit me up in the chat, and this time I actually have it properly set up so I can actually see what's in the chat now. Um, See, I got it set up for live chat now, so I can actually see when people are posting up. And I got the super chat set up in case people want to do, jump on that. But, of course, it is not mandatory. Um, might as well go into some things that I wanted to touch on from a couple of my past videos that I felt I needed to kind of go a little further in depth in. So, first thing I wanted to touch on was on the very last video I put out, which was on, you know, when the, with the whole shiny sword thing, having the two fingers on the wrist. So, my, and, and please forgive the noise in the background, I've, not much you can do in a small apartment when the kid wants to make a lot of noise, and I already told him to keep it down, but there's only so much you can do. So, anyway, I think I didn't make myself too clear about the main topic of that past video, which was supposed to be specifically about taking the two fingers and putting it on the wrist. A couple of people have asked questions or made comments about just this in general and, the, and what this could mean and the usage of it. That really wasn't the focus of the video. It was more on just putting it on the wrist. It was specifically about what it means to put the fingers on the wrist. And I personally feel from looking at different forms, from the stuff I've shown, taught, that it seems to be primarily, that doesn't mean exclusively, but I think it's primarily, that it's about gripping the sword with two hands. Like, you can, if you want to, grip it in two hands. And many of the motions that I see done, every time I see this going back to here, and you're doing a motion, whether it's an offensive one or defensive one, usually you can do it with two hands just fine. And in fact, having a second hand there strengthens the move. I've seen people asking questions like, um, you know, what if you have a shield in this hand, or like a buckler? Um, what if you're, you know, if it's for grappling? What if you're holding your scabbard? And I don't really see anything wrong with those particular questions because it's good speculation. And in fact, like for a lot of people don't realize that in Chinese warfare, there was a time when they were using shields. So there's something to that. Um, there is a time when using the scab in the left hand, especially if it's made out of a rigid enough material, can be used to ward off blows. In fact, I've even seen a form where the scabbard is held in the left hand. I've only seen one form, mind you, but it does exist. So there is something to that. But that's if we're just talking about this hand in general, like what is it, should the left hand be doing? I was talking primarily about just on the wrist. So I just wanted to say that just to avoid any confusion about... because. Uh, Let's face it, if you're putting your hand on the wrist, having a shield there, maybe for a small shield like a buckler to protect your right hand, especially since there isn't a, a big hand guard to protect your right hand, I can kind of see that. Um, but things like but certain motions, it wouldn't lend very well to that. So I think in general, something else in the hand might work, but not for this being here, which is what the main focus was about. But that being said... Uh, please don't take this as a criticism of some of the speculation of questions that I saw in the video, because they were rather good. Um, one thing I was noticing a lot about you guys is that you tend to either ask or you know really good questions, or you come up with some really interesting speculation. It's like, hmm, could be that. 
And I think that's cool. Um, it sort of reminds me of how when people on the internet have a certain goal in mind or when they're trying to figure something out, they can, if they put their minds to it, they tend to be able to find a solution or get pretty close to it or at least gain a whole lot of ground within days. Or sometimes not even days, sometimes hours. Like it's really, it's, it's amazing how that can happen. And it's actually made me wonder if maybe that's something we should be doing for martial arts as well, particularly martial arts research. Because everybody knows a little bit about something. And if you got a whole bunch of, you know, people putting their minds to either researching something about martial arts or, you know, figuring out better ways to implement movements or, um, like, even researching stuff from the past, having a lot of minds on it or working on it, I think we could yield some fantastic results. So, yeah, don't, you know, yeah, those speculations I honestly think you guys were posting up, not just in the comment section, but I got also some stuff in Patreon, some a couple of comments from people in, from Patreon that's really good stuff. So, yeah, I appreciate it a lot. You know, you guys really have some good minds out there. So, um... Oh, whoa, <laughs> I got something cooking over there. Give me one couple of seconds. Be right back. This cannot burn. <laughs> yeah, it's, thankfully, it's not burning. Yeah, everything's within reach, which makes things cool, but unfortunately, it tends to get in the way of other stuff I'm doing, like doing a live stream. And before you guys ask, no, I am not going to be able to do a, whatchamacallit, a cooking on a budget episode anytime soon because this kitchen is just too freaking small for that and I do regret that. I really do want to do another one because I, I got a lot of good recipes that are really cheap and easy to do but you know if you are in a budget you know that would be very helpful for you. In fact I'm doing one right now. This should be done within like the next say eh, I give it five minutes. Most of the heavy cooking has already been done. But again, this kitchen is so small that I just don't really see how I'm going to be able to do a proper, you know, video on it. In case you guys are wondering, it's a basic pasta dish where you just um, you fry up some meat, boil some pasta, properly season it, make sure that you've already cut up your garlic and your onions beforehand and slight you know saute it before you then add your water and all that other good stuff and then at the very end you just combine it and then sprinkle some mozzarella and um, parmesan on top and you're done you know nothing nothing complicated and it comes out pretty well but until i get a proper kitchen which should hopefully happen sometime this summer cross your fingers <sighs> everything should be you know well hopefully that'll be fine and i'll be able to show you guys that as well as um, a couple of Haitian dishes, which are also, you know, pretty easy to do. But they're, you know, they're tasty. And more importantly, ah, they're cheap. Okay, so, ugh, back again. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make sure that that didn't burn. Thankfully, it didn't. Oh, speaking of food, though, um... I've been meaning to, I, I really need to hurry up and make this video. Maybe it, I might do it next week, I don't know, but it just depends on how I set everything up. I've really been meaning to do a couple of like tasting video things. You guys have been asking me about tea for quite some time. Um, and I've got teas that I need to show you guys, um, including some here. And I've been wanting to do a video with me and my son and possibly um, girlfriend MJ. Um, just you know, talking our opinions on teas. And I really need to do it now because my, um, I have a brother living in Japan and he had sent me some stuff, some green tea straight from Japan. I got a couple of them here. Um, like this one, straight matcha, um, which I already have a container of matcha um, on my tea shelf already. It's really, really good. The really good fresh stuff, you know, like when you properly whisk it, it gets all frothy. Yeah, got that. This one, I think it's going to be the same quality. At least I hope it is. Um, got this one here. This this one's also um, the, the, the straight up traditional matcha as well. I think it's a different brand. Um, what I'm getting from this, this one looks like it's just pure matcha. Like I'm, I don't think it's the stuff that you mix with um, 
with like milk and tea and all that, that type of stuff. You got that. You got this. this. These are two different brands, but it looks to me... I, I, I can't read Japanese, sadly enough. So, for all I know, maybe one is a finer grade than the other. Or maybe it's a different brand. I honestly couldn't say. But I'm going to be testing these out, and then I guess I'll find out, right? Um, and then I got, this was a really interesting one. Um, I'm sorry about the glare, guys. I'll put a little bit closer so that the light doesn't glare. God, eh. This, this was interesting because these are individual bags of green tea powder. It's not leaves. It's just powder in the bags. I thought it was kind of weird. But you can, because it's in powder form, you can literally just throw it in cool water and mix it up, and there you go. Like, that's what I have in here right now. It's, it's green tea. It's good. Mm. Certainly better than, you know, buying in Arizona or something like that, you know, because you don't got all the sugar in there. Though, to be fair, the Arizonas don't have that much sugar in them compared to other sugary drinks in the U.S. But, you know, you, you, it, it would help to cut down on the sugar regardless. This is one way of doing it, and it's a lot of them in here. And then, of course, if we're talking about green tea powders, you got the stuff with the sugar in it as well if you want to make your green tea lattes or mix it with milk or something like that, and I do enjoy that, so this was a nice touch. Um, and then finally, I have no clue what this is. Um, this isn't green tea. Apparently, it's some kind of, like, chocolate snack called Heart Olive Chocolate Crunch. I have no clue what this is. But I guess I'll find out. You know, later on, I, I, I want to do a video with me and my son and, you know, us just trying these things out and act like idiots, wh um, whether we go, ah, or, you know, or something in between. So hopefully I'll get that going soon. Oh, um, I need to say hello to people. Um, to um, Jiao, um, I like milk in tea, but it depends on the tea. Like, if we're going to be talking about chai, obviously you're going to put milk in it, right? If we're talking about Earl Grey, yeah, I'm going to put a drop of cream or so in it. Um, but other stuff like like green tea, unless I'm making like one of those so-called green tea lattes, which is such a weird thing to call it because it's not a coffee, but whatever. Um, yeah, I might, you know, mix it with milk. It's, it's tasty that way or, you know, like certain things like that. Um, but in general, I tend to like my teas pure. I only put cream in there if I know it's going to enhance the flavor. Certain blacks I'll put you know, milk in there. Or if I'm making Thai tea, and I know how to make my own homemade Thai tea, and it tastes just like the way it tastes in the restaurant, except you don't got to spend tons of money on a Thai tea pack. Seriously, dude, I really do need to do a cooking on a budget episode on that, because I know people who go to Thai restaurants, and they taste it, or they see it, and they're like, oh my god, this is so good, and then they want to make it at home, obviously, right? And so they'll go on Amazon, and they'll go to an Asian shop, and they'll see a bag of the stuff, and they're paying like close to $10, and it's just black tea, guys. It's just black tea with yellow orange food coloring spun in. And then they brew it strong and then add some really thick cream to it and then a little bit, a little bit of milk and ice and mix it up. That's all it is. If you want to make it at home, all you need to do is go to your local supermarket and buy one of those like, you know, black tea boxes that they sell in bulk for really cheap and just over like just really boil the crap out of it and then add your cream and sugar and put in some ice cubes and you're done. Seriously. It's that easy. And if you really want that yellow color, throw in some turmeric. It's better than the food coloring, and since it's turmeric, it's better for you. There, that, 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 that's, that's your tip for, for today, if you want to make that stuff. Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> enough of that. Um, oh, one more thing before I start looking at questions, I guess, because I really don't have much else to say. Um, this is on a video I did beforehand on the whole gun issue and things like that. Now, I'm not going to be diving into the topic itself, but there's something that I really feel I need to clear up, and I, I think I already did a decent enough job of it, but just in case, I'm going to state this again. Because when it comes to these sorts of talks, it seems like nobody, it's like you either got one extreme side or you got another extreme side, and the funny thing is most of the people I talk to about this tend to fall more in the middle, but you don't really see that getting expressed. Which is a shame, because if it was expressed that way, then I think there would be more discussion and less screaming. So, look, you guys know I'm into martial arts, right? Practice it, right? So, the whole thing about weapon ownership is not something I'm against. 
think I've said this before, even a rabbit will be able to defend itself. Um, I think that everybody should be able to have a chance to defend themselves, however they can. My issue, and I'm not too sure if I did a very good job of explaining it in the video, hence some of the comments I got, and by the way, I didn't really get any nasty comments. Even the two people who I ended up having a back and forth with, I don't know if they're going to be watching this, but if they are, I need you guys to let you guys know. You guys were very pretty respectful. Like, even though you had a difference of opinion, you still presented it pretty respectfully, and you had some decent points. We just disagreed on a few things, but you guys just basically said, no, I think it's this. And that's what you guys did. And a lot of the things that they were doing, I honestly, they had a couple of good points. And the main premise that they were arguing from, I don't really have a problem with. Like, their basic... The basic way that they were discussing was like, look, I want to be prepared, okay? Like, they didn't see it as paranoia. It's, just, it's more like, look, in case something goes down, I'd rather be prepared than not. And I can't really fault that logic. I really can't. You know, it's, it's part of the reason why I try to stay in shape. You don't know what's going to happen, but when things go down, you want to be able to, you know, properly deal with it, right? Or at least deal with it as best you can. Where my issue lies is in how defense is being presented. I honestly think it's being presented in rather unrealistic ways. Right back, gotta turn off the fire. Right, if I don't want things to burn, sooner or later fire's gotta turn off, right? Oh, that's looking good. Now all I gotta do is just sprinkle some mozzarella, some parmesan, and we're good to go. Mm. All right, so. Mm. Again, where my problem lies is how it's being presented. As I said in the videos before, most people who train in firearms, or, or most of you who have firearms, don't train in it in the way that they should if they want to be able to use it in a high-stress situation. They may go to the range every now and then. They may shoot at some cans every now and then. But actually being put in a high-stress situation where it's kill or be killed, where they, they're putting, you know, they're in tight situations, all of a sudden somebody just shows up and they're like, oh, shit! That sort of scenario, a lot of people don't train in. And if you think about it, this is the same criticism we tend to have for martial arts, particularly traditional martial arts, where you got people, they'll punch the air a few times, you know, or they'll practice some basic two-person drills that the other person's just standing there waiting for you to do the technique, but actually going up against a resisting opponent you know, actually coming at them, they don't train for that. And then when it happens, some dude who just knows how to fight in the street is beating the crap out of somebody who's like, I got a black belt. Who cares? You can't use it. We got tons. It's funny how many people who are part of the tactical community, or at least they're part of like, you know, like hardcore martial arts community, or MMA community. We got tons of criticisms for that. But then when it comes to guns, they're expressing some of the same dumb opinions that I tend to see with traditionalists. If you're not training for it, you can't use it. And when it comes to firearms, you really can't afford to make mistakes, okay? You really can't afford to have a mindset that's going to get you killed. Because that is a situation that will definitely get you killed if you aren't prepared for it. And that's my problem. Many of the solutions that are being given, or some of the opinions that are being expressed, are going to get people killed. Simply putting a gun in someone's hand doesn't guarantee that they're going to be able to properly defend themselves with it. They, they, if they're not mentally prepared, they're going to freeze. Or the worst, they're going to miss when the guy's coming at them. Or they might hit somebody else. And God forbid, if the cops show up, they don't know who's who. And that's another ugly scenario in and of itself. I guess where I'm having the biggest conflict is there's a fine line, very fine line, between being prepared and being paranoid. It's a very fine line, and it's sometimes very hard to distinguish exactly where that line is. What I mean by that is like, okay, I know things are changing constantly in today's world, but for now, the United States is relatively stable, okay? Let's just agree for that, okay? Let's just, for the sake of argument, the United States is relatively stable right now. Where I live, I'm not expecting to suddenly see a, a roving pack of guys just shooting the place up. As far as I know, no one's going to be kicking down my door and demanding my valuables. 
But many times when it comes to dealing with self-defense, that's the scenario that constantly keeps coming up. They're gonna, they're gonna come after you, they're gonna kick down your door, they're gonna do this to your family. How many times does that really happen in the US? And these arguments tend to come for people living in relatively good neighborhoods. If anything, that should be the argument that we hear for people living in the really bad areas in the US. But then we don't seem to care about the people living in those particular areas. So you tend to hear this from people living in suburban areas where this shit almost never happens. If you're living in a place like that, it makes no sense to me to constantly keep focusing on that. That to me is obsession. Could it happen? Sure. Just like I could possibly get struck by lightning. Is it likely to happen? Probably not. So it's not something that I'm focusing on constantly. Now, if I notice that there is a situation, if I'm going to be in a place where suddenly there's a lot of lightning storms that are happening around here, then I'm okay. In that case, I better watch where I walk. Maybe I want to, you know, like, have your mind prepared for the situation at hand. And again, everybody's got their own, you know, life experience. And their own, you know, the own things that happen in life that make them, you know, have the opinions that they do. I'm just saying we should try to, if we're going to be talking about such a complicated subject and, uh, you know, a rather, you know, important one, let's deal with it with a sense of reality. Let's not let fantasy, whether it's the fantasy of being the guy who's able to take down other shooters or being the guy expecting that somebody's going to kill them at any moment, let's not let fantasy get in the way. That's all I'm asking. Okay? This is, I, I'm not advocating guns be taken away. I'm not saying that people who like guns or use it recreationally are all psychopaths. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, let's, if we're going to be discussing this topic, let's do it with some realism. That was pretty much the point of the video. Not disparaging people who actually use firearms. I know a lot of guys who use firearms. And I know how that sounds. The point I'm trying to make is I know most of them who use it are responsible adults. And even some responsible teenagers. Many people, a good number of them who own firearms are actually responsible. You know, the, the, the stereotype that we usually see of the, the, the gun-toting idiot, thankfully they're rather small. It's just that the idiots tend to be very, very loud. And distracting. And this happens to exist with any topic, whether we're talking about the firearm issue, or video games, or comic books, hell, even cooking. There's always some small group of idiots that just ruin things for everyone else. And then people think, well, that's what they're like. And no. So, anyway, enough of that. I guess it's time to start looking at basic questions. So... I'm glad for, you know, once again, I'm glad that you guys decided to drop in. I apologize for this being short notice. I literally worked until Sunday morning, and I put out the warning Saturday afternoon. This was like, Sunday, I don't work. It's my first day off, and it's almost the end of April, and I was supposed to get a QA. Damn it, I'm going to do the QA now. I hope it was enough time. So for those of you who made it on here, hell, I'm happy if two people showed up, because I know how sh short it was, so... All right, let's get into it. Um, this probably won't be on for long, probably around 7.15. I'm going to cut this off, 7.15 Pacific time. So for anybody who wants to, you know, let's just get on with it. First, let's actually do some proper hellos to people. I see Hector Gray is on. Oh, oh man, Gilgamesh is on. Sup? <laughs> the same face. Is, it's cool seeing it. It's like, hey, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like, you know, when I used to hang out in New York in the East and West Village, and, and I would just show up to my usual haunting spots, and then I would find my old, you know, hey, man, what's up? This is what it's kind of feeling like. You get to hang out with the same crew. So, and Angel Eyes, Tyler, hello once again. Um, what else? GA5524. Um, I, I, you know, I got, I, don't worry, I'm going to get you your questions. I'm just going down the list of names. Just say hi, hi to people who are here now before I then just go to the questions. I already answered this question, but hello, um, Jao Sturza. Um, and an Advark, what's up? And Jesus saved me. Um, and I should warn you right now, Jesus saved me. I am not very religious, so while I thank you for being part of the chat, I should just tell you right off the bat, you're looking at somebody who was raised with religion and went to Catholic school from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. If they weren't able to convince me, and if the Christian club in, Catholic, in um, college wasn't able to convince me, I doubt you're going to be able to do the same thing. 
this is nothing against your religion, and to be perfectly honest, I have nothing against religious people, but religion's not enough for me. I've read the Bible backwards and forwards. I've also read some of the Quran. I've also researched some other religions. There's a reason why I'm not religious. That being said, everybody's got their right to their own particular opinions or their own beliefs. And I'm not going to be saying anything bad about your beliefs unless you make an argument of it. <laughs> that being said, let's not get into this. All right, questions. So, boom, 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 boom. Angel Eyes said, um, the sheath in your left hand is easy for dual wielding, but two swords is hard to use at the same time, unless you use two smaller blades. And have I ever used two blades efficiently? I don't know if I could ever say that I've used them efficiently, but there was one time, way back, <laughs> we're talking, I was still in my freaking 20s, when I used two swords in a sparring match. Mm. I'm not going to say I did particularly well, but I'm not going to say I didn't do horribly either. I was able to defend myself. That being said, this was back when I wasn't exactly focusing on two weapons. And to be perfectly honest, I still don't really focus on using two weapons at once. But I just simply applied what I knew with hand-to-hand -hand with my left and was able to... Basically what I was doing was defending with the left and simultaneously countering with the right. That's generally what I ended up forcing myself to do. And I was able to, you know, fend the other guy off because he was using two swords as well. It was funny how it happened. Like, we were, like, just sparring. Like, other people were sparring. The guy had his stuff. And because he knew, he was basically sparring against other people who had limited experience with the sword. But he heard about me. Like, I was into, you know, using weapons since a long time. And people knew I was into, you know, Chinese sword stuff. So as soon as I rolled up, he gave me this evil smile, threw me into a second weapon, and then picked up a second one. I'm like, oh, God. And I was able to do okay, but I was just feeling so awkward using the second one because it wasn't something I trained in. After a while, I just threw it down. I'm like, let's just, I'm just going to go back into this. And then I was able to spar on for a little bit longer. That guy, by the way, was a fencer and a damn good one. Um, he gave me a run for my money, but I didn't do horribly either. Like I, I tagged him a few times. He tagged me a few times. And I learned a lot from him from that match, so I, I felt it was a good match. But, um, yeah, to answer your question, I don't know if that counts as using too effectively. It's the only time I've ever done it. I haven't sparred with anybody with a second hand since then. But I think that it's possible. People have done it before. Um, you got treatises in Western martial arts, not necessarily using two long swords, but at least a shorter weapon in one hand and a longer one in the other. They were able to do just fine with it. Um, Miyamoto Musashi built this whole fight. Uh, can't hold a style and find style with short hand, one hand, long, long sword, and the other. The Chinese have their own versions, you know. It can be done effectively. That's, you know, now I have. I've been able to do it. I'm going to say no, except for that one time, and even then, it was kind of clumsy, so. Someone asked me if I purchased a new God of War game. No, because I do not own a PlayStation 4. That being said, I was following the game because I was interested in how it would develop. Even though I knew I wasn't going to be able to play it, I played the first God of War games. The first one I felt was a masterpiece. I absolutely loved it. And then the ones that came afterwards started pissing me off because it just seemed to me that they lost control of what the hell the story was supposed to be about. To me, and not everyone agrees with me on this, the games were supposed to be presented like a Greek tragedy. That's why I love the first one so much. It's not just because the action's really good and the gameplay is fantastic and the spectacle battles and, you know, the, very, the, the quick time events that actually weren't annoying. Um, the characters, like just the game was put together so freaking well, but what captivated me so much was the story. Mm. This really is good. Um, it was presented as a Greek tragedy. And it was. It was done very well. It was basically about the hubris of the main character and how he caused his own downfall, which is why at the very end of the game, he hurls himself off the mountain because he realizes that all, for all his rage, he accomplished nothing but more destruction. That was a great end to the freaking game. And then by the third game, all they just made him was just rage, arg, kill everything. I get to take over the whole goddamn, you know... I kill all the gods and I'm awesome! And you just commit heinous acts of violence for the sake of committing heinous acts of violence. Was the gameplay good? Sure. 
Graphics great? Yeah, great for the time. Was, you know, there was a substance behind it. And that's what I just said, fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> then I saw the rumblings for this game. And I was mildly curious. And as I saw more and more trailers for it, and I saw, you know, how it was developed, I'm like, hey, looks like they got something here. He's, he's trying to redeem himself. He's looking back on his actions and realizing that, you know, maybe it wasn't the best thing to do. And, you know, the interaction between him and his son. I mean, I'm a father, so obviously you're going you're gonna to get me there. And the final product, it looks like a damn good game. I, I haven't played it. And obviously the best way to find out if a game is good is to actually play the freaking thing, which I'm not going to be able to do anytime soon because, again, I don't have a PlayStation 4. And uh, don't know if you guys can tell, but uh, no TV. This, you can't really see it. This screen here and that computer I built over there is my main source of media. So playing PlayStation 4 games is not exactly something that I'm going to be able to do, you know, in the immediate future, but... If I ever do end up with it, or if I have a chance to play it, I'll try it out. But it does look good. It looks like it's going to be rather cool. So, Tyler asks, how do bows come up in Chinese martial arts? Mm, little, really. It's, it's, it's a bow, you know. It's, it's sort of like asking how archery comes up in Western martial arts. You train in the use of the weapon and you hit targets. I mean, I, I'm probably oversimplifying because I know that recently... Um, Chinese, you know, archery is becoming more and more uh, something that people are taking up, particularly like you know, some people are taking up like Mongolian archery. Um, why am I forgetting his name? Um, I feel so bad that I'm completely forgetting this guy's name. Um, he's a well-known person who's been, who's been helping to proliferate Chinese sword arts in the West. Hell, there's a freaking sword that's named that though. And some of you guys probably know who I'm talking about, but he's been talking more and more about Chinese archery. It's, you know, as far as I know, I mean, it's, it's, it's archery. You know, it's really interesting, but it's not necessarily, like, if you go to your typical Chinese martial arts school, it's not exactly that they got an archery class set up. You know, it's something that seems to be exclusive in, in, in and of itself, kind of like how Western archery is exclusive in and of itself. Like, if you go to a boxing gym, they're not going to necessarily teach you archery. Same thing if you go into a HEMA class. Unless, the, you know, you got a couple of guys in there who take up traditional archery, I mean. But it, it tends to be a separate thing, as far as I know. Um, please make some when I can um, do the cooking videos. Yes, I definitely want to bring those back. I already gave my opinion of milk and tea. Um, oh, they make tea candy in Japan, so it might be a chocolate. Yeah, that's what I was suspecting about this. It, it says chocolate crunch. It's just it doesn't look like it's chocolate. It's probably like I don't know. I don't know if it's covered in like green tea, or some type of candy crumbly stuff. Like, if you look at this, and if you guys are wondering what the hell I'm talking about, um, earlier I showed this, and somebody's commenting on it. Um, Sturza, um, Gal Sturza, he says it makes um, tea candy in Japan, and this is one of those. And if you look at the candy, it doesn't it doesn't really look like chocolate, does it? Like it just it looks like. Like little crunchy things, you know, like, like like almost little rice cakes or little granola thingies, but it's probably chocolate underneath. It's like, so, yeah. Um, so, let's see, I disagree on bump stocks from the point of view. Somebody asked, okay, why would you limit yourself to a short sword or a sword and no shield? Hmm, it is a good freaking question. I mean, when, if a shield protects you so well... Why would you go without it? And, I mean, I think there's a lot of different answers to this. And I think somebody who studies warfare, like generally like warfare, would come up with a better answer than what I'm about to present. But honestly, I think it has to do with the limitations of being a civilian. If you're a warrior and you got a, uh, you know, a warrior status, and I say during a time period where melee combat is the norm, yeah, you can afford to, you know, they expect you to have the accoutrements of warfare, you know. You got, not, your sword is a sidearm. Really, when you go to war, you want longer weapons. You got your spears, you know, or you got your javelins. You definitely got your shield. You got your armor. Now, look at it from the sake of a civilian who, if they're lucky enough to be able to have weapons to defend themselves from the battlefield, it's usually not going to be at the same level. I've rarely seen societies coming up where they allowed the civilians to have the same level of armament 
that the warriors that are serving the kingdom or government or whatever happens to run in the country have. You're constantly seeing a certain like give or take with that. And in some situations, they wouldn't even allow them to have any weapons at all. Uh, there's like a, um, an example of an uprising in China where the farmers were literally fighting with wooden implements and farm tools against a well-organized army because they were allowed to have swords and armor and the peasantry didn't. So when you think of that, when you take that into account, it sort of makes a little bit more sense why people who may have swords may have to learn to do without, probably because they did not have access to shields, or weren't allowed to, or maybe it was just too cumbersome to constantly carry around, like if we're living everyday life. And I think we can find examples where this is certainly the case. And a, there's also, you know, a thing to realize that there's different time periods in different cultures used to war in different ways. It's not like everybody in, in every different culture fought the exact same way. Like while one place might be relying on infantry and you know they're, they're, that style like formations and, and, and stuff like that, you may have another one that's dependent on chariot warfare for a while. Or you may have those who are primarily concerned with long range stuff and very little to do with short range stuff. You got certain kingdoms or empires who want, like the phalanx for the Roman Empire. That was one of their main ways of being able to conquer. Like that was their style. Other particular um, places didn't fight that way to their detriment when they went up against the Romans. You know, it's like, so you got to keep these different things into account. And that's just dealing with the warriors themselves. That they're going to have what they need to fight their fights their way. The civilians, not so much. So they got to improvise. And so then they're like, well, I ain't got nothing over here, but I need some way to protect myself here. What do you do? Um, the China, for the Chinese, they came up with, you know, keeping people at a distance. The spear. There's a reason why in Chinese, traditional Chinese martial arts, they call the spear the king of all weapons. Because if the other guy's using a short weapon, you got a spear, you win. Usually. Um, another way is finding out a way of quickly getting inside and getting past the defense. You know, grabbing that other arm with your open hand and then chopping or cutting and doing whatever. Um, Chinese saber play is full of that. You know, the left hand is there to grab or to ward off and then, you know, just cut them down. So, it's not so much that, oh, I feel like limiting myself. What F the shield. It's sometimes more like they don't really have access to it for a variety of different reasons. Maybe it's a cultural reason. Maybe it's they're not allowed. Maybe it's too cumbersome. But it's, it's usually just like when you're dealing with civilian stuff, and a lot of us are training in civilian forms of these traditional arts, they're like using what they're able to use. They're not necessarily using straight up war stuff. Like even today, we have examples of this. For as much as I, you know, the tactical community when it comes to firearms, they got their hands in some great, awesome pistols, great rifles. And able to show some fantastic stuff, but they don't necessarily have exactly what the military has. Sometimes they can, but many times there's some type of limitation. Like, how many civilians you know with a Glock 18? Unless they've lifted that ban in the U.S., which I don't know if they have. But you know what I mean, right? Like, there's going to be some things that you aren't necessarily going to have access to. And we've seen this throughout history, so I'm thinking that's probably what it is with the shield as well. Watch somebody prove me wrong and then say, no, the real reason is because of this, and then make me look like a complete idiot. But that's generally how I've seen it as I was looking at this stuff. Okay. Um, but da, da, but da, 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 going down, going down. <coughs> um, my opinion on Korra swords, it's a Falchion Chinese hook sword mix. I've never heard of this. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't really answer the question. I have no idea. Let's see, let me type it down. Korra swords. Oh! Oh, from the... Oh, these things! Okay, alright. Um, so I, I, I've heard them, I just didn't realize that was the name of them. They look like Indians. Yeah, these are like, you know, from Nepal. This is... I'm going to say that my opinion is... not worth hearing. And the reason why I say my opinion on this is not worth hearing is simply because I have no experience with them. I think they're cool looking. I think they're probably effective for what they're made for. But as someone who has never really trained with them and has not really seen people use them, my opinion means nothing. So I can't really answer the question with any 
real value. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, it's hard to tell when I'm joking. It is weird. It's for his best users. It's hard to tell when I'm joking. I'm sorry. I tend to sometimes have a rather deadpan delivery. Um, and other times, I mean, there are times when I'll just go crazy just for the sake of going crazy, and then you know I'm telling a joke, like, you know, usually when I act like a madman, like, Grr! but generally I, I tend to, like, throw a lot of either sarcastic statements or do things deadpan. That's just how I am, so I'm sorry if I seem kind of confusing. Mm. Damn, this is really good. I need to make some more of that. Okay. So, have I ever heard of Nord Crown Swords? They are a Russian blacksmith and make the most beautiful swords I've ever seen. It's only jewelry. Um, I've never heard of them, but your descriptions got me interested, so I wouldn't mind checking them out. Um, and some just clicked on my phone, which I'll check later because my phone just was allowing the light coming down here so you can see my face more. I'll check it out later. Um, I wouldn't mind checking it out. I need more time to start looking at more swords. And, and this actually allows me... I, 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 I want to kind of delve into the kind of sword market at the moment. Because I've been meaning to kind of do an update on a video I made a long time ago on where to get good swords and how to find them. That video is hopelessly out of date because so much has changed since then. I mean, the general advice will still do you okay, but as far as where to find the swords and who makes them, yeah, I desperately need to make a, 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 you know, an update on that because so many of those companies don't exist anymore. Um, and others may not be as good as they used to be. There's it, it, just a lot, a whole lot that has changed. So I've been meaning to do that, and I wouldn't mind asking for some of you guys' help on, you know, because I, I still, like, know of some places that are worth going to if you want to get swords. Like, Cult of Athena is still a really good, just general, all pl good place to go. If you just want a sword, you don't know where else to go, check out Cult of Athena. they got great customer service. They usually separate the wheat from the chaff when it comes to good swords. They usually can hook you up. Um, but as far as the Chinese market goes, so much has changed. So much has changed. It's like things just keep fluctuating all the time. And this is not even taking into account, you know, how the economy has changed also and how it's getting harder and harder to sell and buy swords depending on where you are in the world. Like, new bills are being passed now that's just limiting things even more. Like, I feel sorry for some people in Europe, like in, like in England. You know, like, it's just making it harder and harder just to get in your hands on a sword, you know, like a katana or something. Just because, oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> um, it's getting harder and harder to sell things to these people. Like, when, the, the, when I used to be in the, um, the business, when I was, like, working for a sword company, the hell we went through just to get swords out to the UK was ridiculous. And now they're coming out with new bills, and I'm, I think they're already out with some of those. It's just making it even harder. I, I, I really feel sorry. And like, there's other countries where they're putting limits also. So with this constantly changing landscape, I really feel like I need to come up with a new video on like how to get your hands on swords, depending on where you're at and what, what roadblocks you may have to learn how to get through, who's worth buying a sword from, who's not. And while I am focused more on the Chinese aspect of things, I wouldn't mind hearing about other cultures. Like, you, you're saying, talking about Nord swords. Um, is it again? Let me look at it. Nord crown swords. Um, I like Western swords. I may be into Chinese stuff, but I really like Western swords. Like, the way they look, um, their function, their usage. It's some cool stuff. I see why people are into Hema. It's some really cool stuff. And again, when considering that, you know, as a kid growing up, I was raised on reading things like Lord of the Rings and, you know, the Conan movies you know, sword and sorcery, fantasy, you know, things like that. I just had an attraction to the sword, and that sort of stuff is just kind of, you know, woven into my life. Like, So I, I lean toward those type of weapons, so I can't help but look at them and go, you know? So I wouldn't mind checking this guy out, definitely. Um, I need to, somebody actually just put something up in the super chat, so I need to address it immediately before I go to the other question. Um, it's from Discount Viscount. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the $5. Um, Big fan, he says, what weapons and methods were preferred for Chinese armored fighting? Spears and heavy weapons. Um, the little, little bit that I've seen, when it comes to straight up warfare, they love their spears. 
nice, nice long spears, and they usually were heavier than the type of spears that people are training in right now. Um, and then when they wanted to smack, like either they wanted like good long range piercing weapons, the bow, there's a reason why archery was big there um, for general warfare. And then there were like the maces. Now, I know some people have seen um, like those like Chinese hammers or what they call the war ha mallets. It just looks like a, you know, like a standard, you know, hammer stick, but it's got a ball instead of like a hammer shape. Um, or it'll have like this octagon shape. And while those were used, what I've seen more are just these like rods. Like they look like the length of a sword, if not a little bit shorter, but they're like, they're just heavy metal rods, heavy metal sticks. And those were maces, or sometimes I would call them whips, which you can scratch your head on that one. But they would use those to like strike heavy blows to crush bones or to, you know, do damage to helmets, then to crack them. And the funny thing is, if you guys have ever seen Detective D and the Phantom Flame, that weapon he's using, that's an example of it. Um, it's just these, these metal rods. And, like, not everyone had them, but it was used a lot in the battlefield, and sometimes it would be heavy ones. You know, sometimes it would be one's hands, you know, but it, 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 would, it was like a good mace that you would use for that. And, of course, you had your sidearm. The, um, especially the doll. When it, um, when it comes to sidearms, the doll just supplanted the Jin completely by the end of the Han Dynasty. For good reason. It's a good cutting, hacking sword. And besides, with their interactions with the Middle East and, and those cultures, that was their weapon, and they realized it's a good freaking weapon, so that's what they kept. Um, School Auditoria recently, a while back, did a video on Persian um, sword arts, and he was like describing the techniques from the book, and it was interesting, and several people pointed this out to him in the comment section, how a lot of those movements are seen in Chinese fighting. You know, especially the whole wrap around and cut. Transferred over to the Dao, the Chinese saw that, and they're like, that's some good shit, and continue to use it. And it's not all that surprising when you think about it. Not just because, you know, the interactions with the Middle East, but there is a, um, an Islamic community in China known as the Hui people. And they've influenced a lot of Chinese martial arts. To this day, you can see remnants of Islamic martial arts fighting. And it's woven into Chinese fighting. We just generally say, oh, it's Chinese long fist. And it was the Muslims that introduced it to them. So it makes sense that also Middle Eastern swordsmanship is interwoven into, you know, Chinese saber fighting, doll fighting. But yeah, um, I, I say if, um, the methods that I've generally seen when it, like, armored fighting, long range stuff, the spear was heavy, Lee and use. Archery was heavily in use, um, and then smashing weapons like the rods, and then of course if you lost those weapons, you had the doll, a good heavy cutting weapon. I mean the doll was used all the way until World War II. That's how much they found it to be very effective when it came to like fighting. Like, I mean, of course World War II it wasn't necessarily armored fighting anymore, but even during armored fighting, those were the weapons you tended to see, you know hacking weapons, cutting weapons, and long-range piercing weapons, and, you know, you're occasionally a good smashing weapon. Um, but that's generally what I've seen. So, all right, so, ho hopefully I answered that question properly for you. I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, it was worth your time to actually donate the five. So, if I didn't, I'm sorry, smash me over the head or something, and I'll try to answer it better. Um, so, um, Hawk Fumon said that, I have a question for heavyweights. I don't like ground fighting. So what's a good style that's not MMA, boxing, or Muay Thai? Um, well, boxing or Muay Thai isn't ground fighting. So you got your answers right there, I think. Um, I know MMA is mostly considered to be ground fighting, rolling around the ground. But you remember, there are a lot of MMA fights where the guy wins through striking, not through ground and pound. We've been seeing a lot more of those lately. You know, just good striking arts. Um, so if you don't like ground fighting, just focus on boxing or focus on Muay Thai. Now, if you don't like those two, for whatever reason, and you still want to learn something that's not, you know, ground fighting like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu type stuff. Um, I'm trying to... Th um, there's Krav Maga. Um, which I... I mean, I know there's some ground and pound with that, but it's also supposed to be a, a no-nonsense stand-up fighting style as well. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. I mean, to be perfectly honest, like, boxing and Muay Thai seem to be, like, really good heavyweight fighting styles to learn. 
I mean, if you want to, like, just focus more on the Chinese style of things and you're kind of heavily built, sheesh, I would suggest something like, um... Well, some people might say Hungar, but Hungar, you gotta be you, you gotta be able to move. I'm not saying that heavyweights can't move, but you know, you better be prepared for that. Though it has some heavy strikes, um, one that really takes good advantage of your weight and learning how to properly shift into your blows. Um, not Bagua, um, Baji, Baji Chuan. That's oof, that's a heavy hitting style. There's a reason why the Japanese love it so much, even though it's a Chinese style. It's it's hilarious to me how whenever. Japanese either like manga writers or anime creators or video game makers they're like hmm we need a kung fu style let's go with Baji it's, it's hilarious to me how it's only fairly recently that I've seen them start showing other styles other than Baji Chuan but it's like either it's GQ no or it's Baji Chuan or some derivative of Baji Chuan like every time I see a so-called like especially in older video games there's a Chinese stylist you see how he moves that's freaking Baji <laughs> But if you see somebody stepping forward with a quick stomping motion with an elbow like that, that's 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 Baji Chuan, <laughs> pretty much. And it's supposed to be a really explosive style. Like you just hit the dudes and they just go flying back. So it's, I would say if you're like a heavyweight type person, you know, that's a style for you. Uh, the you know pretty much any. Well, well, I hesitate to say any. Like I'm not necessarily certain that heavyweight fighters want to take up something like Tongbei. Um, Bagua, oh yeah, definitely, especially if you take up something like Chen style Bagua, because it's a little bit more of a wrestling art, but not a roll around on the ground wrestling art, more like a you pick the dude up and throw him on the ground wrestling art. Um, there's that. Um, Shinichuan, maybe. The, you, th that's definitely something that you, um, it's really focused on proper stepping with your blows. It's, you can see it's military roots and how it's always moving in a straight line. Um, so... I mean, I, I hope that answers your question, like, with certain arts. Like, and that's if you don't want to get into boxing or Muay Thai for whatever reason. But I do have to straight, stress that boxing and Muay Thai by themselves are not ground arts. They're stand-up striking arts. So, you know, if, if that's what was keeping you away from those arts, I can tell you that. Ground, you know, ground fighting is more in the jiu-jitsu set, particularly the Brazilian jiu-jitsu set. That's what was introduced into MMA. And because it's so effective, that's why it's still a mainstay in MMA. I mean, it's there because it works. You know, I know there's a lot of criticisms on MMA, but one thing I got to give them, they're, it's a practical, they wanted stuff that practically worked. They wanted practical movements. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu proved itself. That's why it's still there. So, um, Somebody was asking me, I want to ask, um, what do I know? By the way, um, I'm just, I need to mention names here. Um, Yeshua, um, I hope I am not pronouncing the last name wrong, Kuryoga, I'm saying Yeshua, um, or Yeshua Kuryoga is asking me, what do I know about the more obscure weapons in Chinese martial arts, such as the trident, which is in the eight arms of Wushu? Um, one thing I've seen about a lot of the weirder stuff is that either they're specialized weapons for a particular use, or they're specialized weapons for a particular style that isn't necessarily popular. Or it's a new invention. I haven't really seen any other category for the weirder weapons. Um, the trident or, like I've seen like, or the tiger hook fork. Which is originally used for dealing with tigers. Hence its name. It's a specialized weapon. Can it be used to deal with people? Certainly. Was it commonly used by a lot of martial artists or fighters? Warriors? No, they had their standard weapons. Um, I tend to view the weirder weapons the same way I would look at specialized rifles today. Are they useful? Yes, but for a specific purpose. You wouldn't give an infantryman a sniper rifle and then say, get the hell out there. You give them to snipers who have a specific purpose. Um, you know, same thing with, like, say, submachine guns or, you know, like, certain weapons are made for a particular purpose. And a general use weapon um, is not something, you know, a general use weapon is, is, is going to be the most, uh, the, the one that's going to be the most practical that most people use. The weirder stuff is what catches our eye, or the specialized stuff definitely catches our eye. And they would be useful for particular scenarios or for particular people who are specialized in its use. Um... But from what I've seen of it, they're not something that somebody's going to go, Oh, that's better than this weapon, so it's going to be my main one. It's like, you know, either they focused on it 
or it was for a specific circumstance. Okay, and I just got hit with another one, again, by Discount Discount. Once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You didn't have to do it, but that's why I really appreciate it. Um, how practical is the Guan Dao against armored foes, and is the oversized Guan Yu one actually good for training? Okay, the Guan Dao is a heavy weapon. So, yeah, it's supposed to be good against armored foes. That being said, um, the oversized one would be good for training if you're trying to build your strength up. It should be noted that no matter what culture you're looking at, Weapons are not really all that heavy, because people have to use them. If you got a weapon that's so heavy that you're going to put it down after a couple of minutes, then obviously it's not good enough. Because you got, especially if you're on the battlefield, the battle's not going to be over in five minutes, unless you guys were really, really good. Um, so you need something that's going to help you out. Now, I actually wanted to do a little bit more research on the Guandao. I've been trying to do a little bit more stuff on that for a particular video, because I'm I've been planning on doing a series of videos specifically on particular weapons. And the Guandao is a weapon that's kind of hard to pin down on battlefield usage because there's so much myth behind it. Like, the name itself, it's named after Guan Yu, who's turned into somewhat of a mythological type person. Like, some people even kind of worship him a little bit as in a god of war. And he's based on a real dude who lived during, you know, the Warring States period of China. But he never used a weapon like that, because that sort of weapon didn't exist. Most likely he used a shua, which is a, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's a type of spear with a long spear tip. But that big, broad, curved blade did not exist at that time period. That weapon, the Guan Dao, I think, came about during Ming Dynasty China, which is way later. I, I might be wrong, maybe it came out in Song Dynasty. Somebody correct me. I think it came out during me, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong about that, now that I'm thinking about it. Might be some. But the point is, it came out after he lived. It came out way after he lived. Um, and it's pretty damn heavy. It, I mean, I've seen people properly use it, but again, there's some people who are using really, really heavier versions of it that wouldn't be practical for everyday use. The standard one can be used, but it's still kind of heavy, so you've got to have some, you know, you've got to have some strength to use the freaking thing. What I see used more often, which is kind of a cousin of it, is the Poodle, which is a lighter, quicker version of it. Um, it's still got that nice long blade, you know, curved blade, so it's good for cutting, and it's got that long handle, but it's a lighter, quicker weapon. Um, it's been given the nickname the Bandit Knife because, well, a lot of bandits used to use it, and it's it's a good weapon for dealing with a variety of different scenarios. You know, you've got that longer handle, so you got the reach, and you also got that leverage. But since it's not super long and really heavy, you can employ it for mid or close range fighting. Um, and since it's lighter and quicker to use, it's, you know, you can be able to use it longer and it's a bit more effective than the Wandao. But that being said, because of the heft of the Wandao, if you're trying to get through armor or do some damage, it's going to do that damage. And if you got one that's not... This is a pole weapon, so I would say that, you know, it's not heavier than five pounds should be useful, you know, it should, it, and I, I could easily see it being useful against armored people, because if you can't cut through the armor, if the heft of the weapon at least damages the body behind it from the blow, well, there you go, you know, and if the armor is weak, then, well, it's all she wrote, right? So I hope that answered that question. Um, she's, and I'm going to have to scroll up, and no, oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, I'm going to try to get through as many of these last questions. Okay. Whatever questions are on the list right now is what I can deal with, and i got to cut off because I wasn't going to be on for too long, and I'm sorry, guys, um, but I plan on doing another QA next month, and then hopefully I'll make that one a little bit longer, and I'll probably do it at a better time. So, scroll. Drop my say I love you videos. Oh, thank you tonight. Um, we take it back. I appreciate that. Um, but da -da 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 -da. My, somebody's asking... Um, the sword broke and you need a new one. Katanas are great to use, but too much stamina, so I'd rather use a Chinese sword. Um, well, Chinese swords can kind of take up your stamina, too, depending on what sword you have. Um, like this one! The one that I reviewed a while back. Um, it doesn't really weigh that much less than a katana. Um, at least a good katana. Um, I'm used to katanas weighing around... Close to, like, a, like around two and a half pounds. Sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. 
but they generally tend to be around two and a half pounds. And this sucker is, if you were, if I remember correctly, I think this was around two and a half pounds. How, because of how it's balanced, it doesn't feel like it, but it's around that. And I find these days with the market, um, that's generally what you're going to find. Like if you want a good functional den, you're going to be around two pounds and up. And sometimes a little bit more than that. If you're looking at just the regular training swords or the crap, then yeah, sure, you're going to find plenty of one pounders or so. And they don't really take much. Um, like the one that you saw me use in my last video, that's the Hans... Um, Hans, what am I saying? That's the Adam Sue Den, which is this one. <laughs> Throw it over there. This thing is light as hell. This one was specifically made for training. Um, it's it is good steel. It is you know these are high carbon steel sword and it's got a very sharp tip, but uh, no edge. See, so it was made specifically for training, and you notice the blade is pretty thin. That's why it's so light. You know, it's very light. So if you want to keep training for a very long period of time, there you go. It's just very light, but. I mean, if that's what you if that's what you want, if you want a very light sword just for whipping around, yeah, you can get one. Just keep in mind that it's not going to be a functional sword, as in a sword that you can like has a you know a sharp edge and can cut targets with. If you do get a sword like that, realize that they're going to weigh around around how much a katana weighs. Maybe a little bit less. They're going to average a little bit less than that, unless you're with a really bad sword maker, and I've seen a few of those. A gen should not weigh three pounds. Rant for another time. But yeah, just letting you know the weight's going to be similar. So keep that in mind when you're hunting them down. Okay. Any advice? Oh, this is from Hector Gray. Uh, any advice from learning Tom Tui when videos are your only resource? Mm. Make sure you've mastered each road before, like, one, okay, here's some basic tips for learning Tan Tui that will help. One, you want to take each road separately. What I mean is make sure you really understand what each piece, whether you're learning 10 road Tan Tui or 12 road Tan Tui, and I've heard there's even a 14 road though, I've never seen that one. Make sure you understand each one before you move on to the next one. Okay? I love you. Um, and understand what it is that it's trying to show you. There's a reason why it's, it's, a, um, a, it's a belief in um, the Kung Fu world that if your Tan Tui is good, so is your Kung Fu, because all the building blocks are there. So when you're trying to learn it, make sure that you understand and you can fluidly do each road. And you also, like after you've at least gotten the form memorized, and you can just go through the form backwards and forwards, the next thing you want to do is start doing each road out of order. That you can flow into, like, you don't want to just do it in order. Now you want to do it so that I'm going to start with road one and jump into road five, then go into road eight, then go into road three. Like, just switch it up. If you're able to do that easily, then you know you've memorized each piece well. And then the next thing you're going to want to do, take it to another level, don't keep going in a line. You notice the roads are always in one right line. You're going to the west, then you're going to the east. You're going north, then you're going south. You, or, you know, for other people wondering what the hell I'm talking about. Either you're going, you're going first, you're going to the right, then you're going to the left. And you're, going, you're always just moving in a straight line. You're not curving. If you want to take your Tantue into another level, start shifting the direction in a little bit. What I mean by that is, and now you guys are going to laugh at me, showing my really bad form. Let's say you're going... You know, I'm just going to start off with a basic punch. I'm not going to go into Tante but let's say you go here, right? And now you know the next move you're going to do is this, right? Well, when you land the foot, you don't necessarily have to land it straight in front of you. Because you know the next move is going to go, you're going to, you're going to go here, and then you're going to want to, like, put up your next leg, right? Because I've seen one version of Tante where instead of going into, like, the next set of movements before you do the kick, I've seen one where it goes like this, and you go one, and then you go two, and then you go three, right? Well, who says you got to go on a straight line? Why don't you actually, when you go here, then you kick here, then you kick here. Change your direction. Because remember, in real fighting, the dude's not going to stand in front of you, right? He's not going to just, you're fighting a dude. After my punch, he's going to shift over here. 
He's not gonna just stay there and let me. I'm gonna hit you anytime I feel like. No, he's gonna move around. So I'm moving around. If you throw one blow, your next blow shifted a little bit. I recommend you do that after you've already memorized the form, though. <laughs> you gotta already know before you start breaking the form, you gotta do it right, right? So those are some tips I can give you. Um, and finally, one more tip. If you only have videos to work off of, see if you can get your hand on Adam Sue's versions of it. Because he it's one of his favorite forms to teach, and he not only teaches them very well and actually shows, like, gives you an idea of what you're supposed to teach you, like applications and what you should be thinking of as you do them, but he also, I think, came out with a version where instead of teaching it the traditional way, where it's row one, row two, row three, you know, the, the usual way they teach Tantwe, he broke it down so that he teaches the easiest road first instead of the traditional way. So if you're having a, a problem trying to learn the form, the way he teaches it will be a little bit easier for you to grasp. So hopefully that work. So there's that. Okay, so... Ba -da 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 -da. I will definitely look into the swords, um, Mr. Sturza. And you already got my attention about the Shakasha Sabres because I really like the look of Shakasha Sabres. Just, yeah, I really, really like them. Would I say that Bagua is a good self-defense? I personally think so. But not if you're going to be looking at the people who are mostly dancing with it. Which, unfortunately, is most people. The reason why I think Bagua Zhang is really good for personal self-defense is because of one aspect of it that you're going to have to hunt somebody down to get it, and it's the pole training. I noticed that my close-range fighting got a hell of a lot better when I started doing the basic pole stuff. Because what it's teaching you to do is to change up on the fly at close range. It's similar to Wing Chun in a way, but not exactly the same. Like Wing Chun, you know, you got you know the, the you got the wooden dummy and it's got all these different motions, but it's all these preset motions. Bagua Zhang, it's just a pole. There's no arm sticking up. It's just a freaking pole, and you're changing your arm positions as you walk circles around it. And while there are preset hand motions. You're supposed to just do them on the fly. There's no, okay, I'll start with this one, then go to this one, then go down this way, then come off this way, go to the low one, switch to the high one. No, there's no, you just do them. You just switch up depending on your body position and how you feel. And while you're doing that, your legs are also doing things like checking the poles, like, like you're acting like you're checking someone's leg or you're hooking as you're doing the arm motions. And these things actually work great when you translate them to like hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It's really amazing how you'll just suddenly, like you'll throw a punch or somebody does a move and you block it and then you suddenly find your arms just going into the positions that was on the pole because you're now you're going into grappling range and you just kind of go in and just toss them to the ground. You're, and you're not afraid to do it because you already learned how to get up close or you could do things like slip the punch, shoulder check, the guy stumbles back, you put your foot behind his foot, he falls down. You were already training to do it by doing the pole stuff. Like, it's funny how all this practical stuff is in this art, but most people, all they want to do with Bagua Zhang is learn the forms and walk in circles and look pretty and dance and spin around. And then they get knocked out by an MMA guy. <laughs> I know you guys have seen that video, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's, I guess I'm going to give this the same answer I give any martial art. Yeah, it's effective if you're training it practically, which means staying away from the fancy stuff and focusing on the practical stuff and then finding somebody to try to use it on who isn't going to just let you do it. Good luck with that. That's one of the problems with Chinese articles. Um Captain asked me, do I have any plans on working with, uh, making another video with Skull soon? All I'm going to say is there are things in the works and that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I just lost my price all of a sudden. Freaking mouse. Okay, so first thing. Ah man, okay. Oh, um Ah, Nick is on! Um that's the um, historical fencing guild. Hey Nick, what's up? Who needs to make more videos? Um he says I'm better with Western swords than I give myself credit. I don't think I'm as good as I should be, but eh, I, I tried. He's saying that because we used to Spar, he was showing me some basic rapier stuff, and he's definitely the better rapier guy than I am. I'll, thanks for the compliment. Um, yeah, Gilgamesh just pointed out the weapon in Detective D. Um, 
everybody and associate end up in a mental hospital. Like, what? Like, I can't answer that question. Sorry, Random Panda Studios. Though I'm sorry that that's the case. Um, Black the Berserker, me versus Scholar Grimm in Mortal Kombat. Who wins? Do you mean in real life or the game? In real life, maybe him. I, I think he's definitely got the temperament for him. In the game, most definitely him because I don't like Mortal Kombat. I mean, I'll play it every now and then. I mean, the, the height of my interest in Mortal Kombat was Mortal Kombat 2. Um, I just don't like Mortal Kombat. I, I really don't get what... Well, okay, no, I do get why the game is popular, but the animations are stiff. The characters are freaking uninteresting. And it, I will admit that their story, um, the story mode for Mortal Kombat 9 and 10 is very well freaking done, but as a fighting game, there's better stuff to play. Jesus. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Um, why do I gotta do this as you go to bed? Alright, do I have any opinion of on Troy LeFou? I've never studied it, but I knew some cats who did back in New York, and I always thought the art looked really cool. Um, they, they, they had some really good um, moves, and one of those dudes, he actually went to high school with me. The guy was able to handle himself. Um, they tend, I mean, they have some really cool weapon sets. They have kind of like a, a no, I personally thought that there was a sort of no-nonsense mentality to Cho Lei Foot when it comes to hand-to-hand. -hand. You see that with a lot of southern Chinese martial arts styles, by the way. This sort of hard nose, I ain't here to fuck around kind of sense to southern fists as opposed to some of the more, uh, some of the northern fists. Like, Hungar, Choi Lei Foot, um, um, tell us another one I'm trying to remember the name of. And this, why am I suddenly freaking forgetting, um, White Crane. Like, the, these southern arts, it's just like, I'm just going to go in and knock you the fuck out. <laughs> I, 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 I know there's a lot of tradition steeped into it. Wing Chun, same thing. Like, there's just this, this tradition, and it is, you got to, you know, there's a certain way you want to do the forms and all that, and there is some mysticism stuff thrown in. But for the most part, when you're actually learning the hands, you just go in there and knock them out. Like, <laughs> there isn't as much dancing, and that's one thing I appreciate about southern fists, southern styles. And Trailer Foe is no exception. Those interesting, because Trailer Foe... Well, I keep saying Chole Fo because I've heard a lot of people pronounce it that way. Chole Fo or Chole Fo. Um, and if I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing it both ways, so again, I'm sorry. It's it's interesting seeing that style because it's there's a lot of northern movement to it. And I, again, I have to be very careful when I say northern and southern because that generalization is very misleading. But there's like um, it, there's a lot of like kind of a, I'd say a northern a stereotypical northern structure to it. But it's done in that stereotypical southern way, which gives it a very unique flavor that's interesting to watch. So I, I do like the style. I would assume I'd be a fan of Joe Rogan. Have I seen this discussion with Boss Rutten? No, I haven't. And something tells me I'm a poorer man for it, so I probably should check up on that. Okay. So the Lord Guan Yu had a sweet beard. Yes, he did, Black the Berserker. Yes, he did. I'm beginning to wonder if I'm trying to get one myself. Though I doubt it's going to get any longer than this, and I don't know if I should try to get a beard longer than this. Um, I know they were ground and one of I've already learned those, and I taught myself boxing. I just feel like the styles like Baji would give you an advantage. Yeah, it would for power issuance. Um, one thing I like about Baji Chuan is that it's they're just these. It, the way it delivers power and the way it teaches you to deliver power in your blows, it's unique. <laughs> it's, it's pretty unique. And you, there's a reason, once again, why it's been celebrated over the years, both in China and Japan. So if you find somebody who really knows that art, it's worth checking out and seeing if you can pick up a few moves from it. Or, you know, study it. Um... Is if weapons drain your stamina, do crouches lower your stamina? <laughs> um, if you do it too much, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm almost at the end here. I'm trying not to skip questions. We won't get to that question. What question? Seen every offender. Have I seen the discussion? No, it's the same question I answered before. I was not. I I haven't seen it, but I'll check it out. Answer questions quickly. I'm, you know, the reason why I don't answer questions quickly is because I'm trying to give you guys thorough answers. Do you really want me to throw out one sentence answers to your questions? <laughs> like, so what do you think about this and this and that and that? It sucks. Next. Nah. <laughs> what the hell are you watching? 
you know? Um, anyway, oh, Demo! Yo, dude, what's up? Yeah, later on tonight, we gotta put more bullets in cops' heads, so, just saying. Um, if I'm not playing something else, what happens? Um, da -da 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 -da. And I said, by the way, Purple Heart Armory put a low-cost gen trainer out in the same stuff as your Italian. Have I heard anything on it? No, I remember you telling me about this before. And I um, looked at it and it seemed really interesting. Um, but I haven't heard anyone else talking about it. So if I get some extra cash together, I might want to pick it up and then bang it around and see what I think. Um, which, re Speaking of which, I was going to have a sword to review and I thought I'd have it by now. But because of recent events and recent expenses, I had to put that on hold. Um, not to try to put a downer on things, but my grandmother died recently. And I had to fly out to New York for the funeral. Um, it, it, in fact, um, some of you guys, a couple of you guys already know about that. I was gone um, last weekend because of that. And it's also the reason why I didn't really put out a video this week in, in you know, a decent time. Because kind of was caught up being in New York. Um, and a big, since it was an emergency flight, like it just, this, just, I mean, I knew it was going to happen, but I was hoping it was going to happen later this year, and it just suddenly happened this year, so all of a money that I was putting aside for other things, I had to quickly use to get down to the, you know, to New York. So, yeah, some things I had planned for the channel have to be put on hold, but hopefully I'll be able, you know, I'm going to, you know, the job I have right now is, uh, thanks to you guys, and also thanks to my new job, I'm able to kind of build up my funds better than it used to. So hopefully I will be able to get that sword and review it and then some other things for the channel. So. Um, <laughs> you know somebody takes that thing out of context. Yeah, let me clear that up. Yeah, I don't really need somebody kicking down my door. I play Payday 2. More of you people need to play Payday 2. <laughs> um, especially since um, right now the spring break is starting tomorrow. So... Um, uh, now they're lowering the price of the base game again and to entice you to play for the full version, which really isn't all that expensive, and you get a hell of a lot of content for that price. Um, it's a cops versus robbers game, and you play as the robbers, um, you know, doing heists, committing crimes. It's a, it's a really fun co-op game. I've, I've been playing it since 2014. Really, really like it. Um, and now the whole spring break event, those of you who haven't played the game know that we've been looking forward to it because we want to find out what happened to Bane. No, I'm not explaining to the rest of you who Bane is or why. And now it's too late, I hear the sirens coming. Thanks a lot, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, yeah, Payday 2. That's what I was talking about for anybody who's concerned. It's just a game. Um, actually, I also really need to get... Um, there's other games that I need to get back into playing. Tekken 7, I wanted to play more with you guys. Street Fighter 5, um, I need to get back into playing a little bit more, particularly with one dude um, I haven't been able to play with him lately. And I need to get back and playing as a, you know, there's co-op game. I need to put, there's a video I wanted to put out where I talk about all the games I like playing. So, like, if you guys have any of these, please jump in. But, yeah. And, um, thanks for everyone giving me condolences. I really do appreciate it. Um, my grandmother was a strong woman, and she meant a lot in my life. And, I mean, it's, it sucked that she's gone. It's an understatement. But we were kind of expecting it, and I was able to talk to her before, you know, things went down. And I got her blessing and all that, so. It's bittersweet. I mean, it's, that's how I'm taking it. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. Um, meant to ask for my opinion. Um, I, I really feel like I missed some questions here. Um, Sound subscribe. I meant to ask my opinion on on what? I'm trying to quickly go back up before I cut this off. Did hate knuckle boxing influence Southern Styles of Kung? I don't get this question. Um, did hate knuckle boxing influence Southern Styles of Kung Fu? Hate knuckle boxing? I don't know. Oh, there's the question the other guy was asking. Like anything on Chinese war axes? I know next to nothing about them. I know axes are in Chinese martial arts, but as far as war axes, I know next to nothing about them. Sorry, I I should be focusing. There's a lot of stuff on. Um, on Chinese weaponry that I need to learn more about. Oh, bare knuckle boxing. Did that have an influence on Southern, on 
on on on southern martial arts? I think so. Um, I've heard. Granted, this is hearsay from other Chinese masters talking about their lives. But, you know, back when I was, like, reading interviews of different Chinese martial arts masters, one thing that I noticed popping up every now and then is, it might be a stereotype, to be honest, but I kept reading, oh, Southern Chinese guys love to fight. Oh, they love fighting. Like, it was constant. Like, you know, I, you know, and it was like, you go down there in the South, you say you're a Kung Fu master, someone's going to show up to your door. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you know how to fight, huh? Um... And then, of course, there's the stories of Bruce Lee and the crap that he used to pull off before he left Hong Kong, you know, getting, you know, hooking up with, you know, some of the Wing Chun crowd and fighting in the street and lumping dudes up. So I'm thinking that had an influence. Actually, there's a funny story about that. This is the last thing I'm going to say before I cut this off, because I think you guys are going to find this interesting if you don't know about this already. Wing Chun, I think part of the reason why it got so popular in Hong Kong is because, hmm. Ip Man wasn't necessarily training his students in the traditional way. And by that, I mean that he was training them in stuff that normally they give to intermediate students. And what that thing was, was chi sao. You know, like the whole, I, I, it's not push hands, but you know what I mean. Like the whole, you know, when they're like, you know, you've probably seen this in the Wing Chun where both guys have their hands and they have to kind of feel each other out and then, you know, try to slip in punches and, and deflect. That's supposed to be intermediate level stuff. He was passing this on to students apparently from the beginning. And that gave them an edge on other schools at the time. And I can see why. Because that's a practical thing to learn. If you're fighting somebody and you already got a sense of where they're at, like if I throw a punch and you block it, and I know just from just from touching you, now I know where you are. And just from me touching your arm, I can then sense when you're about to pull back or move forward. That's a huge advantage you have over the other guy if he doesn't have that same type of knowledge. If he doesn't have that same type of um, sensitivity, that helps you out so much in grappling. It helps you so much in counterattacking close range. It helps you in knowing where they're going so you can trip them up and make them fall down. Like That's a big advantage you have over somebody else that doesn't have that. Yeah, bridging techniques. When you have those, when you got that in mind, and, and you see this, not just in Chinese martial arts, good boxers have that knowledge, right? Um, Wrestlers, good grapplers, definitely have that knowledge. They have to. To know how to, like, oh, I, this guy's trying to slip this way. I'm going to quickly go with him and throw him down. And then now I got you tied up. And a lot of traditional artists didn't have that. Especially not at the beginning. But these Wing Chun students were getting that. Huge freaking advantage. So now that when they're out in the street beating the living crap out of people, hey, Ben, I still see you. I know. I'm trying to get something to eat. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm about to cut this off and then dinner will be served. Um, Sorry. Um... They, now they're going out in the street lumping dudes up. It became a problem. Like, it was such a problem that there was a guy who was actually making Wing Chun dummies for Ip Man school. And he stopped doing it when he found out how much carnage the students were causing in the street. They, they were seriously effing people up. Like, they, were, they were lumping dudes up. Like, it was like just almost gang warfare type. Just, like, you know, just knocking dudes out. So... He later on stopped making them the dummies, and he felt ashamed. Like, he thought he was contributing to the problem. <laughs> like, he said, I'm ashamed I ever gave them this stuff. Like, you know, like, you know, this this kind of, you know, belligerent behavior from these people. Dad. So, I guess that kind of answers the question as to whether bare-knuckle boxing influenced Southern fighting styles. Yeah, I think so. Here's a good example of it. Now, this is more of a, a relatively modern-day story, because, you know, Itman was teaching you know, in the 1900s. But the very fact that these schools were fighting each other in the to begin with hints at some street-level rivalry stuff where students would just come together and, you know, box each other down. I still sell the so, pasta. And, hmm? I still sell the pasta. Yeah, don't I'm going to serve some more. <laughs> um, so, what was it? Yeah, I, I honestly think that it, it seems to me that Southern martial arts, particularly toward, like, the latter end of things, seem to be more personal. Um, but I've seen written down that when you start, when you're studying Chinese Northern arts, and again, I speak in the very general terms, when you're studying Chinese Northern arts, you're studying stuff that's more rooted in military type fighting. Whereas when you're studying Southern arts, they seem to be rooted more towards personal or civilian type fighting. So, and you kind of see that because Southern arts tend to be a little bit more close ranged. You know, more like, you know, more hand focused stuff and you like trapping techniques, bridging techniques, stepping in and striking, grabbing kicks, throwing them down, things like that. 
Whereas the Northern Arts is more longer range, more push them away. And a lot of the movements are based on using weapons. I've talked about this before. A lot of Kung Fu movements were based off of weapon techniques. Like, why the hell am I doing this? Because if you put a weapon in his hand, now it makes sense. So, you know, it's kind of interesting how that's kind of, um, how that works. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting the mentality here. When you focus more on military techniques, your focus is more on the weapons and more longer range stuff, which we can again see in modern times. Modern warfare is based on the use of weapons and fighting people from longer range. Whereas us on the civilian side of things, when we want to study self-defense, we're studying knives and pistols and more close range type stuff. And I'm, you're kind of seeing this kind of you know, different mentality with so-called northern and southern arts. Stuff that's level, more street level and then stuff that's more battlefield oriented. And then, of course, both of them getting knocked because they're rooted in tradition, and you know, we can. That's another conversation in and of itself of how how well they're adapting to modern times. So, okay, that's I, I gotta end it off now. I was supposed to cut off. What was it? Twenty minutes ago? Twenty five minutes ago? So, sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, twenty five minutes ago. Now we're running on twenty six, and now he's asking, "What about dragons? I like dragons. <laughs> I really like dragons. Um. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say. So, um, I'm glad you guys showed up. Once again, I mean, it's I'm really glad that even in such short notice, you guys show up and you're willing to ask questions. And this time, I actually, somebody actually donated in the Super Chat. Once again, Discount, Discount, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you guys were able to get something out of it, even though it was kind of short notice. Um, I will try to have another Q&A for next month, and I will probably try to have a fixed topic for it once again, because it seemed that you guys liked that format, so I'll try to have something set up for the next one as well. And, um, now i got to try to figure out, besides, of course, feed the peoples, um, feed my son. Um, i got to figure out what's going to be coming up for this week, you know, the next video. I, I still want to try to stick with that schedule that I put for myself, where I try to put out a video every week, or at least, you know, at least three a month. At least three a month, if not four. Yeah. The, the, uh, I, it seems that that's just enough content for you guys where it's not too little, not too much. So I, I'm going to try to stick with that. And I hope I can keep that up. And I hope I can, you know, continue to provide stuff for you guys that you are, you know, interested in watching, whether it be my martial arts stuff or me ranting about things or philosophical, political stuff or whatever. Just, you know, as long as it's interesting to you guys, then I feel like I'm doing my job. So, all right. Um, again, thanks for showing up. It was great hanging out with you guys, and um, yeah, I'll catch you guys later. Take care.